Well, let's talk about it a little bit. And now I think you okay. call it the wedge breathing, right? And yeah. So, so describe what this process is. Well, the one of the things I, I want to say, the reason I call it a wedge breath is that there is one of the steps in the breath has to do with pulling the the core muscles in in the abdominal area. This is the umbilical area and close to where your navel is, okay? And, and, you know, medical terms, they, they, they refer to it as the core sometimes and so forth. It's abdominal. Now, I want to uh, step aside for a moment and say that a lot of the trumpet people, teachers, say that when you attack a note that you should push your belly forward towards your belt buckle. Well, what happens is scientifically, the muscles, the three layers of muscles in the abdominal area from your sternum down to your groin, there's three layers there. And I don't, I don't want to do an anatomy class here, but they all are pointed in different directions and they enable us to move and twist and do things. I mean, because without the three layers, you couldn't do the, all of the things that our body can do with the twisting and turning and bending and stuff. They are there scientifically for a very specific reason. But I can tell you that when, if you push to play the note, you're, you're compressing air and you're, the compression pushes against your diaphragm, which is not, it's not a muscle, it's a membrane. It's not made of muscle tissue. It lays, lays just below the sternum here and the lungs sit on top of it. So you have this, dome-shaped diaphragm with two lungs sitting on it. So when you, when you compress, the, the compression down here in the core area, all these muscles push against the diaphragm, which therefore pushes against the bottom of the lungs, forces the air out through the trachea and out into the mouthpiece. It's a very simple process. It's like C-spot run once again. But the minute you, the wet part of it is that on one of the steps, one of the major steps in the intake of air from uh, your belly here, and this is the outside world out there. The first step of the breath, you push your belly slightly forward like that, towards the belt buckle, okay? But you're not thinking belt buckle so much here. You're just taking your, your navel and moving it slightly forward, but a nickel's worth because it has only one purpose. And that is that your diaphragm sitting up here, dome-shaped, when you push the belly forward, the diaphragm drops like that, okay? So you take a little breath, diaphragm moves down. And when it moves down, the lungs are sitting on top of it. So as the diaphragm moves down like this, the bottom of the lungs fill up. The only way you can, this is called complete breath because it has low, middle, and high steps in the breath, okay? So... The average person breathes middle breath, okay? People who do a lot of running and stuff like that tend to fill up a little more on the top end, you know? Most of the historical problems with the respiratory system, like tuberculosis and things of that sort, come in the upper part of the lungs because we're erect now. And through the evolutionary process, and we were on all four, the lungs are on a horizontal plane and they expand this way. But when you stand up, the lungs are trying to do this and you have pressure on your shoulders down on top of the lungs. So there's an awful lot of restriction in Homo erectus, you know, Homo sapien, as we've evolved from Neanderthal up through all these steps, you know. Um, and plus the fact that we've, we've become such couch potatoes too, you know. We sit, our posture droops, our, the, the, all of the spine shrinks as we get older, you know, it becomes, you get all of these problems where the, the, the discs and everything and the, the, uh, vertebrae. The, well, the discs in between, you know, in the, in the vertebrae and so forth, they get tighter and, and the, and the bones move closer together and you start getting back problems and, Stuff like that because we're standing up, you know, and everything scrunches down. And, you know, I'm like three and a half inches shorter than I used to be when I was in graduated high school, you know. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. I we used to, if I put on a pair of pants the, the length that, that I wore 
when I met my wife, I mean, they go all the way to the end of my feet now. You know, so. <laughs> well, where so so where does the power come from that Depression. doesn't that doesn't exist in you know if we're not doing this? Well, there's two kinds of breathing. One is voluntary, and the other is involuntary. Okay, voluntary breathing would be when you decide to do something, blowing candles out on a cake, for instance. That's a voluntary breath. But when you're sitting like you and I are right now, it's involuntary. It's pre-programmed into the genome system to keep us alive. You know, the, it's a, without going too deep into all of this, the diaphragm is programmed to keep us alive. And what it does is it can sense the, the amount of pressure that's inside of the lungs. When the outside pressure outside of our body becomes greater than the pressure in our lungs, and if we don't do something about that, like take a breath, the lungs can collapse on a person. And they have Doc, uh, Arnold Jacobs, as you know, uh, with a tuba player with Chicago Symphony for years with great virtuoso and teacher, but he had a collapsed lung, you know? And Tom Harrell had a, a lung collapse on him when he was younger, you know? Quite a lot of people have had collapsed lungs. The average kid that falls off of a bicycle or something on a playground gets the wind knocked out of him the diaphragm senses that lack of air and it goes <gasps> and makes you take a breath you if you tried to hold your breath to commit suicide the diaphragm would say nope you ain't doing it <laughs> it'll it'll override you it's pre-programmed to keep us alive you see so there is programming in the body so what happens is when you take this breath in and you decide you're going to, comp you have to compress the air. Well, compression equals velocity. The more PSI that you have, the tighter you make the, the belly muscles down in that uh, umbilical navel area, the tighter you make them, all of those muscles react. There's a, there's a whole family of muscles that are part of the respiratory system. It's called the thoracic family, thorax. Okay, it's the basic body of, from the neck down to the groin not our arms, not the appendages, arms and legs or skull, just the thorax is neck to groin. That's look at a beetle's body. It's got a body and, and then it's got legs, you know, antenna. We, this is our antenna, so to speak, you know. But anyway, the whole point about it is you compress the air, the more compression PSI, the faster the air is going to move, okay? The faster the air moves when it hits the lips, the faster the vibration, the higher the pitch. This is so simple. This is, I mean, you could write the entire process on the back of a matchbook cover. Con contrast that with how the typical brass player breathes. Somebody comes to you and they're having difficulties. What, what is, um, contrast your wedge technique with how the average brass player kind of just naturally feels he needs to breathe. Well, and there's like, an awful lot. Well, I mean, it's, it's a broad answer, but the, the, you get an awful lot of, People, uh, I heard a guy in the military back in the late 60s give a clinic near Washington, D.C., and he said, he walked up very, very arrogantly to the microphone, and he said, I'll tell you how to play the trumpet. You've got to be totally relaxed at all times. Now, I'm a linguistics fan, so totally is an absolute. Well, Einstein said there are none in this universe. That's, a, that's scientifically impossible. So you can't be totally relaxed, but relax is we know that it means essentially to get unnecessary tensions away from our body but if you're going to hit a home run you got to swing the bat you know you can't walk out there and be well i just want to relax well even if you're bunting you got to control everything you know and the old point about it is that when somebody is told to, to relax to play they don't use their muscles. They say, never lift your shoulders. Well, the word never screws that up because in the, in the yoga breath, when you lift your shoulders, you don't have to do this with them, but you have to do that with them. And why? Because you have pectoral muscles and bones and stuff sitting on top of the lungs up here. And if you lift them off, the upper part of the lung will fill up and you get by a little bit of proper shoulder lift, you can increase the average intake capacity of, of an average human being 25 to 35%.
it's like having a third lung sac for so it's a wind instrument wouldn't it be nice to have three lungs instead of two yeah but it's it's a matter of capacity and so the point being when you look at somebody like maynard for instance who is notorious for the power and everything and he's the guy that i have gave gave me the yoga book the point about it he was shown that method of yoga breathing by a trumpet teacher in New York by the name of Benny Baker. And Benny Baker was Toscanini's principal trumpet player for many years. He was classical. He wasn't like a Conrad Gaza or anybody like that, you know? But he showed Maynard that breath when Maynard was 13 years old as a winner of a little talent contest up in Montreal. And the rest is history. And by the time Maynard was like, I have recordings of Maynard with the radio, with a Canadian radio band when he was 15 and he didn't have those chops yet. And uh, I have all these recordings of Maynard, but at 16, when he out, went out on the uh, Charlie Barnett band, I think it was, when he was 16 years old, he was getting those chops. By the time he was 17 and stuff on the Kenton's band, said his chops were all over the place, you know? Then so the point being that that breath got poo-pooed by an awful lot of people like uh, Max Schlossberg and Harry Glantz and the classical guys in the New York Phil. And a lot of classical guys see poo-pooed this breath saying, oh, no, 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 no. Shoulder lifting, oh, no, push, push the belly out against the belt buckle. And then many say, no, no, that's not right, you know? And if you go back and, and look, which I've done a lot of, you know, I'm a research kind of a guy. But you go back and watch some of the old soundies, the black and white soundies from the 40s, the big bands, and you're going to see Conrad Gazzo and a lot of these guys, they're, they're lifting their shoulders. They're going, holy God, look at all the, all, why do all the good guys lift their shoulders, you know? And all of the guys that, that follow the little rules and never lift your shoulders and push out your, and never do this and never tighten up and relax, 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 and no tension. They don't have any chops. You know, they can play fourth trumpet in the Lamar's Iowa concert band, but that's about it, you know. So wait, so after Maynard gave you the yoga book, what did what did Bud tell you that made the difference? Well, he showed me how to apply it to the trumpet with the compression factor, you know. And he showed me that like uh this the steps he showed it to me as one movement. And the one movement was to kind of start the breath by taking a breath out and then and then coming down and like that, like swinging the golf club, you know? But in trying to teach it, it was damn near impossible to try to teach that whole one movement. I tried to break it into steps. A friend of mine who was a trumpet teacher, a Trump, not a trumpet teacher, he was a pro golfer in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and he came to a Jamie Ebersole camp one time and, uh, back in around 75 or six or something like that. And he came to me, he says, Bobby, you know, there's a golf video that I'll show you. that will show you how to, he breaks the golf swing into components and you can might use that for the breath. And so I got that video and I studied it. And I went, that's it. So I have step one is to put, take a little small breath with the belly out forward for the purpose, sole purpose of lowering that diaphragm and allowing the first air to come into the bottom of the lungs. It's the first swing up here, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's the first little grip and, and just getting started. Right. Okay, so then the second step is to pull that core area where the navel is, to pull that back, like this, the body's back here. So the first step, this would be the core area. You take a little small breath and you go, and push the belly outward. And the second step you go, like this and that's called i called it a wedge because it's like a door stop you know you go wow you slide it under the door and the door is locked and it's not going anywhere or if you're going to chop wood you put a wedge in there and you know and i got this feeling like of ah oh, it's kind of like you're wedging and what happens there physiologically is when you pull that that core muscle inward towards your spine 
what happens is it gets underneath the diaphragm up here and all of the muscles, instead of being out here, you know, pointing to your neighbor, they go underneath the diaphragm. And then when you, 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 so that's step two of the breath. That's the wedge part of the thing. That's the most powerful one. And at that point, you've filled up the majority of the inner part of the lungs. The max, you've maximized your breath at that point. Okay. So that's step two. Step three is when, while you're holding step two, not really tightly, but just enough to keep it in place, you do a little, you don't, you don't go way up here because that pinches too many nerves in the neck and everything, but you come up slightly like this and that varies. Now I would say step two and step three, which is this, they have a variable based upon what you're gonna play. And on the illustration that I sent you, it says at the bottom note, steps two, three, and four are variable based upon what you're going to play. So if you're going to play like something mezzo piano in the lower register, you don't have to take the King Kong breath. So the amount of velocity that, that you're going to play has, is, the, is the going to be, de, it's going to determine two things, the register that you're in and the dynamic that you're in. So if you're playing in the low register mezzo piano or mezzo forte, you need, you don't need a lot of compression because the air is going to move more slowly. Okay. And it's, it's going to be less air, but moving more slowly. As you go up in the register, you need, in order to set up faster vibrations in the tone production mechanism in your lips, you have to increase the, the compression to get the velocity. The two, it's physics, okay? It's all, it is a simple C-spot run in acoustical physics, you know? So, and, if, so let's talk about pressure. How do I know if I'm applying too much pressure on my, with my mouthpiece? It's probably going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing about it is, invariably, when I see people using too much pressure, pressure on the mouthpiece and pinching the, th the first two P's of the three P's, you know, the pinch and press. That's invariably the first thing I do is check their air because if a person does not support from down there, the entire mechanism of, of compression and support and trying to, to create all of the tension that's necessary in the body to play, it shifts up to here. There's nothing in between, you know, and people try to talk about like breathing from here. No, 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 no. This, the sternum area where the diaphragm is, leave that alone. Don't you go in there. The diaphragm is well protected, hidden back in there. And I think it's a wise thing that whoever designed this body said, oh God, put the diaphragm back there because the trumpet player is going to mess with it. They're going to try their damnedest to get a hold of it you know and you and you really can't the only way that you can really start to control the mechanism of the diaphragm is through the use of the muscles down in the core area and the umbilical area the tighter you make those muscles down there they activate all of these muscles that are part of the abdomen okay the three levels we talked about okay then they go up to another set of muscles that are in your ribs. In, in between the ribs, all of these rib cage, there's muscles in, in between the, the rib themselves, inner and outer, and they're called intercostals. And these muscles activate. It's like if you walked into an office building, 30 stories high and 6,000 insurance desk sales people there, whatever. And you threw a master switch on the ground floor, all the offices would light up. And when you activate from that uh, core area down there where the wedge is, when you throw that switch, it activates all of the muscles, not only the, the abdominal muscles, but it gets the ones in the intercostals in the ribs, which help it activates the diaphragm pushes up it activates muscles in your back and even up into your neck. These are called sternocleidomastoid muscles. And they come down from behind your ear and they come and hold it. And they're all part of the, what's called a thoracic family. 
and that is when people talk about the diaphragm, oh, you got to use your diaphragm. You know what? The best thing in the world for a wind instrument player is don't even think about your diaphragm. Think about breathing properly and the diaphragm will function because the minute you put your attention on the diaphragm, you, you're not controlling the air. The diaphragm is going, will you leave me alone? I know what to do here, but you've got to get to the source of the diaphragm, which is down in the core area. It's the belly button area. And it's not exactly the belly button. It varies, but a person has to find, in yoga, they call it the hara point, H-A-R-A. -A. But you don't have to do that. I mean, all you have to do is that it's somewhere in the vicinity of your umbilical, your navel. It's somewhere down in there. It's going to vary from person to person. But one way to find it is, let me scoot back a little. If you take, let me tilt this screen a little. If I come back to down at here, okay, it's there. And if I poke up, oh, that's no good. Oh, that's no good. But if I come down, I search around and I take my hands like this, okay? I'm jabbing. I'm not trying to hurt myself, but I'm looking for where's that spot? Oh, there it is. There's a spot there I can go, oh, doesn't hurt. Solid as a rock. But Ooh, if all I got to do is move an inch higher and I'm go, oh, ouch. And that's the horror point. And it's there for everybody. Nobody, nobody survives without one. Well, I, I was reading, you know, your, the stuff you had sent me. And so I was thinking about the, uh, that point. And I was practicing that night with specifically, you know, trombone, specifically thinking about that. And I can tell you my range was, was a good third to fourth higher, just thinking about the, the origin of that power. Yeah. It's, well, I'm not surprised. And if you practiced it a little bit more, you'd probably add an octave within, <laughs> a, couple, within a couple of weeks, you know. But everybody that plays correctly does that. I mean, there are exceptions in that, you know, there are some people who don't quite do it exactly like the yoga breath, the wedge breath but they are still compressing down in that area. If they're not, they're playing up here. And this is where you find endurance problems. You find uh, the minute the pinch, press and pray becomes active because of the fact that the person is not controlling their air compression from down there. The minute it comes up here, you have to compensate for the fact that the support is not from below, it's down here. And when so like, when you do it from below, you're, you're controlling the air from below. You're forcing the air from below up to this area. And this area where the armature is, its job is tone production for the most part and controlling the release of your airstream into the instrument. It's not supposed to be doing the compression too. After you looked at the first three steps, which are all intake, you know, um, the fourth step is a, the point of compression and it's there's a gripping device that you use down in the hara point or down in the core area and so once you've filled up the lungs you and and the abdominal area is back still in from step two where the wedge movement is then you grip those muscles should not really grip until four but having said that when you move in on step Two, you're pulling muscles back. There's a difference between pulling the muscles back and using the muscles to come backward inward without tightening them up like this, you know? And so on step four, once your lungs are full, you grip like this. It's an isometric grip and you, and Bud Brisboy, when he taught this thing to me, he said, you know, you've got to tighten up like you're withstanding a punch from somebody, you know, like, and sometimes when I teach this thing in person with a, with a student, you know, which I haven't been able to do for quite a while now with this pandemic, but, but when I w would uh, teach this to, to somebody live, I would have them, I would take my fist and, and I would poke them. I wouldn't try to hurt them, you know, but I would have them withstand the punch. I can, let me just tilt it, like, spin up, something like, you know, in okay, case so we have one out, two and three shoulders up then that I grip that 
like it's solid as a rock, you know. Now, this step two, which is the inward movement, step three, which is the shoulder lift, and step four, which is the gripping device, are variable. And it says that on the bottom of the illustration. It says steps two, three, and four are variable based upon what you're going to play. So the degree that you would come in on step two depends on if you're going to play like if you're playing mezzo forte and the staff, you're not going to need this massive inward movement. S similarly, the the amount of shoulder, how far up you go on the shoulder, depends on what you're going to play. And third, the amount of of tension that you create at this gripping point is also variable based on what you're going to play. What happens? Uh, what what happens with the muscular system when you grip like that? It's an isometric, okay? An isometric is, is it's like a static almost kind of a feeling in that a muscle can, like say a, a bicep, you can elongate a, a muscle in a bicep or you can pull it in like this and tighten it like that. Or you can just go, mm, and that's an isometric and that's not moving. And so when you, grip in step four what you're doing is you're creating compression you act this is like the master switch yeah i think i mentioned that if you went into an office building and threw one switch in all of the, all of the office desks every light in the whole building came on from a master switch that core area down there where the horror point is that's your controlling point for the, the whole compression factor which is compression equals velocity. The more PSI pounds per square inch that you build up compression in the lungs, the faster that air is going to move. And so you're controlling your airstream from that horror point from down there in the abdominal area. So when you grip on step four, you tighten. Then step five is you lower the shoulders. And when you lower the shoulders, you're you're putting back the pectoral and muscles and the clavicle and everything on the top of the lungs. So there's a little bit of a compression coming from the top of that. That's step five. Then step six is, you know, blowing to, to let the air exit. But the whole exiting point is when I do a, a, a breath with a person in person on this live, I have them I, I, I let me tilt the, cam the camera down a little bit. When I do like step one here, then in, two, three, up, down, grip four, shoulders down, then five. While I'm blowing, I'm making sure of the firmness of that gripping point that we get on step four. So that's your controlling uh, point for the breath. From there, a person that controls their airstream, the compression and therefore velocity of movement of the air, from down there, uh, it, it, it's better to control it from there than it is up here because you only have two options really on this thing. If you're not controlling the air from down in the abdominal area, it's going to come up into your neck in your face you know and that's where all of the compensating factors of pinch press and pray so to speak go in where you have to start compensating for the fact that your airstream is not very well controlled so you're having to do it from the upper part of your body and this is where you find so many problems with with injuries to embouchures of pinching embouchures like therefore the aperture goes out of control and a guy's uh, the the aperture is too small. The aperture determines the quality of the sound, the slot, you know, the, the body of the sound. And so the larger the aperture, the larger the airstream. And as I, it's redundant, but to go back and cover what I think I've said is that the aperture has to do with two things. The registry that you're in and the dynamic that you're playing. So a large aperture is a loud note. It's also a low note. And as you go up the scale, your jaw, chin jaw, whatever you want to call it, however, 
it moves up and reduces the size of the, the uh, aperture as you go. So fortissimo, mezzo forte, pianissimo dynamics, low register, middle register, high register. And so as, as your jaw comes up like this and you reduce the size of that aperture, it helps keep the speed up. And so the air comes up based upon the compression factor, sets up the vibrations in the lips. The tighter you make the modiolus out here in the corners, this is like one big family all doing the thing. To, it's like a teamwork thing. It's even though we teach, we isolate when we teach so that we can pinpoint uh, uh, weak areas within the breathing mechanism, but it, it's just one great big family. And what happens is to kind of go back over things again, you have this entire family of muscles. It's called, it's called a thoracic breath, not a diaphragmatic breath, as I've mentioned before. People talk about the diaphragm, the diaphragm, the diaphragm. Leave it alone. I mean, don't interfere with this son of a gun, you know? It's like if you get a hold of that gripping device down there on step four, at that Hara point, if you really find where that is and learn to activate from there, you're activating all of those muscles, the three layers of muscles in the, in the abdominal, abdominal rectus and all those things down there. You're activating all of the, inner, the intercostal muscles in the rib cage in between the rib. You're activating that and activating the sternocleidomastoids in the neck that come down and hold your sternum up, you know, and the diaphragm. And when you activate that gripping thing in four, it, it activates a whole thing up against the diaphragm and the diaphragm, like your ribs are here and the diaphragm's here and as the diaphragm moves up, they call it rib excursion. How many ribs does the diaphragm move fast as it pushes the air upward and outward up through the trachea and on into the oral cavity and out to the mouthpiece. So it's, a, it's an incredible, when you see it actually, it's incredible. I wish I could show it to you, but I have a, I have a, a film that I did in a, in a hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, a, a doctor there by, the, um, and what was his name? John something, I can't remember his last name. Uh, nice cat too. He was a trumpet player, but a doctor and kind of, as he was a surgeon, but he had moved into uh, kind of doing into radiology and stuff like that uh, in his older years. And he brought me in and did a fluoroscope of me playing the trumpet. On the fluoroscope, you can see the, my, rib, my diaphragm moving up past the ribs. You can see the degree of, of motion of the diaphragm as it's pushing. And I play all the way up to double C on the fluoroscope. So you can actually see, it's, it, I have it here somewhere. It's on an old VHS tape needs to be transferred to a DVD of some sort. You know. let, me, let me ask you a question. You were talking about the aperture size. Is it fair to say that, regar that regardless of whether it has to be smaller or larger for range or for dynamics, that the more open, the better is in terms of tone? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, one of the most common problems that I find with brass players, especially trumpet players, I don't teach that many French horn players or tuba players, but I do it occasionally. But the most common problem with players worldwide is that they play too tight, you know? And one of the reasons that they play tight, there are several. One of the reasons is their breathing is not really the best it's not that their breathing is totally wrong. I'm not, there's people, I, I would say this to you that not every great player on the world does the yoga complete breath, the wedge breath, you know, that would be ridiculous. But if you go back and, and I think I've mentioned, if you go back into the old black and white soundies of the forties and stuff like that, and look at those old films of the Gene Krupa band, Charlie Barnett band, and even ones that were not as, well known as that, but if you go back and look at some of those, you see guys like Conrad Gazzo and all these guys lifting. You watch Doc Severinsen when he plays, his shoulders are like dominant, like they're up and down constantly. You know, I've, I've watched a lot of those old films and you see people doing that. So the point being that, that when a person's breathing is not at the best that it could be, they're going to have a smaller aperture up here because they're having to 
try to get all of the, the velocity factors and the so forth done with their face. And the minute they do that with their face, they have to pinch the aperture. Well, the aperture is going to be small. Back to answer your question, the point being that that when the aperture is, there's a, a, a thing that I have an article on. I don't know if I sent this to you. It's called slot searching, but it's on my website. And it has to do with a, a, a simple action like this. Like I can demonstrate this for you. Is this okay, Michael? You want me to do this? Yeah. All right. So let's just say, let's just say a little, a little Joey comes to me for a lesson and I say, let me hear you play a G on the staff. And he goes, you know, which is pretty common. <laughs> I mean, I hear, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard one of those, you know, I'd buy Rhode Island, you know, <laughs> but you know, and so I'm, he's too tight. So what I have him do is this exercise of lowering his jaw. Now, I want to interject a little thing here is that there's a thing called note bending that Jimmy Stamp is famous for passing around and tons of other teachers uh, use that technique with their students. It's a, it's a yes and no for me. It's a thing like this. The problem with that for me is that you're changing pitch. Okay, so if you start doing that, well, you're not controlling the intonation of the quality of the sound in tune. So why go flat, you know? But if you do this, there's a point where you go too much. That's too much. But in between that is, That's a mezzo forte uh, concert F, second line G on the trumpet. It would be your fourth line F on, on, the, on the trombone. So that is the slot. And from an acoustical science point of view, a slot is a centered note. And when you center a note, you maximize all of the overtones that give it body, give it sound, give it quality of a note and say, ooh, isn't that pretty, you know? 